Welcome back to the introduction to matinee. In this video, what we're going to do is introduce you to the matinee editor. Now, when I say introduce you to the editor, I'm not talking about what we did in the last video where we said, check it out, it's the matinee editor, isn't that cool? <laughs> in this video, we're actually going to talk about the editor. We're going to use it. We're going to talk about the different parts of the editor and how to go about controlling data in the editor. And of course, to do this, we need some sort of matinee sequence in place. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up that very simple matinee sequence that we showed you in the last video that had a lift in place where a player could stand on it and the lift would take the player up in the air for a second or two and then take the player back down to the ground. That's right. So in setting that up, we'll then have data in place in the editor and we'll be able to walk around the editor and talk about how all the different parts affect the data. That's right. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I want to do is create some sort of an object that we can stand on that will behave like a lift. And just for the sake of ease, I'm going to steal one of these plates from the floor. So I'll right-click on this, and we'll choose the very handy Sync Generic Browser option, which will select this static mesh for me here inside the generic browser. We can close that now. Right-click on the floor again, and I'll choose Add Actor. Now, before I actually choose anything inside of here, let's talk for just a moment. There are two actors available to you within this list that are pertinent for creating a matinee sequence. We have the basic interp actor. And this is the, uh, the actor you're going to bring in any time you want an object to be animated through matinee. In essence, it's just a dynamic object, something that's going to change in time, and in this case, we're changing its position over time. So whenever you have uh, some sort of static mesh that you want to move about your level, you want to use an interp actor. Now that brings us to our other option, which is a mover, and this is where it can get a little bit confusing, especially if you're looking around for uh, tutorials on the web, or maybe you're browsing forums and people are talking about creating uh, lifts and doors, because you're going to hear the word mover a lot. Mover is actually an older term from previous versions of Unreal, and uh, you'd hear it for anything that was an animated object, such as a door or a lift. These days it's really all about interp actors. What a mover is, is an interp actor that comes in with some extra stuff already connected to it for sake of convenience. That's right. It's already got the event already attached to it, already has the matinee sequence already uh, applied. Yep. Everything you need is really there except for your animation. Now, the cool thing about using a mover is that uh, it's, it makes the setup of the interp actor very much like animating a mover in previous versions of Unreal. So if you were used to creating lifts and doors in uh, such as UT 2003 or 4, you're going to be right at home using the mover, but also keep in mind that in general, the mover is going to be geared mostly toward very simple lifts. That's really what it's all about. But since that's what we're making, it'll work out perfectly. Let's go ahead and choose add mover, and boom, we get a mesh, and I'm going to kind of move it over here into the middle of the floor, and it's a little big, so let's uh, shrink it down to about 0.4, so it's a little tiny thing. And if we take a look here in the middle of our floor, you'll notice it's completely black. It is not lit. Only lights that are broadcasting on the dynamic lighting channel are actually going to affect movers. So uh, that's something we'll run into later on when we start putting in the door. So uh, for now, let's just uh, keep it here with this object. Now, I'm going to jump into Kismet because something interesting just happened inside of Kismet when we added this mover. We get a subsequence. Now, in my case, it's called interp actor 7. On your end, it could be interp actor any number. It could be uh, all sorts of things. But let's go ahead and double-click it to jump into it. And check it out. We automatically get the mover event. It is already connected to a matinee sequence object. This uh, matinee sequence object already has a group which is attached to our interp actor. And if we double-click the matinee sequence object to open up the matinee editor, we already have a group and a movement track added for us. Now, if we hadn't used the mover, we would have had to have created all of this ourselves. That's right. Uh, because we chose the mover, we get this sort of prefabricated network uh, set up for us, which makes animation a lot easier. Now, before we actually take a look at the intricacies and all the buttons, knobs, switches, and dials of the uh, matinee editor, let's create a very basic sequence. So for now, just follow along with what I'm doing, and uh, it'll all become clear as we go. And then when we're done, we'll take a look at everything that we haven't yet covered inside of here. So, the key to working with matinee is this big timeline area. Everything that you create as far as keyframes, all of your different tracks, they're all going to have data that's stored here inside this timeline area and within the group and track list located here on the left. So, what I'm going to do for starters is roll my mouse wheel down 
And uh, what that's going to do is zoom us out a little bit so we can see a little bit more of our time. Notice we have a dark gray area over here, which means that we have, you know, there's nothing going on over here. We have a dark gray area over here. This is also nothing. All of our sequence takes place within the range of zero seconds to five seconds, and that's what this timeline is all about. It's just giving you an indication of our time. Now, I don't want our lift to take five seconds to go up. I know that sounds really impatient. Every elevator I've been on takes more than five seconds to go <laughs> up a floor. But we're playing a game. Everything needs to be fast-paced. Except those elevators at places like Six Flags. That's true. <laughs> now, I, I do like those, but you've got to stand in line to get on those. Yes, you do. So I'm going to bring this down to about two seconds. And notice what I did here. I clicked on the small red triangle, and this is actually changing the end time for our sequence. So it's just dragging that around so I can make my animation longer, all the way to seven seconds. Seconds and beyond, I could you know drag us down here and make it maybe all the way to 10 seconds if I wanted a really slow elevator. But I'll just drag us back here and bring it down to about three. Now also notice something else. I'm going to be kind of jumping around a little bit just so that in case you're trying to follow along with me, if anything confuses you, uh, I can make the uh, you know, alleviate your confusion more easily. In my case. It was really easy to jump this right over to a flat three seconds. If you're following along on your end, it might uh, might not be so precise. You might have 3.02 seconds or 2.997 seconds. Make sure that up here in the top of your toolbar, you have a little snap drop down. Uh, currently, I have this set to 0.10 seconds, and you're going to turn on this little toggle snap button right up here at the very top. And if uh, if the tooltip will work with it, there you go. It says toggle snap. If you turn that on, then editing this becomes a lot easier. If we turn this off, I can get very Im well, I guess precise would be the word, but I mean, I would call it imprecise, especially if I want three seconds. So let's turn that back on, and I'll snap that right back over to a flat three seconds. Excellent. So now my entire sequence takes three seconds. Let me roll us back in with the mouse wheel to give us a clearer idea of what we're working at. Now... What else do we have here in the timeline? Well, we've got this little green section, and I want you to just kind of take mental note of it, say hi to it. We've got these little tiny green flags that we can use to adjust its size and whatnot, but this is going to be a little bit more important here in a second. I just want you to see it and know that it's there, and it's not like an automatic thing. It is something we can change, and there's a reason for that. All right, let's go ahead and create a very simple animation for our lift. Now, Animation inside of uh, Matinee takes place through tracks. You are going to animate on a specific track. And in this case, we've got a group. Within this group, we have a movement track. Now, if we uh, take a look here, just kind of to give you a concept of what is actually going on behind the scenes, notice the name of this group is Mover Group. And if I get our Matinee window out of the way, we have a Mover Group input at the bottom of our Matinee uh, sequence object and that is connected to interp actor 7. So our object is created in, is I'm sorry is attached into the group and the group itself has an animated track which is uh, by by that means it's moving our lift around. That's right. And in this particular case we have only one object tied into the mover group but we can have multiple objects and then all of those objects would respect the animation that was then put into the movement track. That's right, and that, uh, if that confuses you, don't worry. That's something we're going to be demonstrating a little bit later on in future videos in this series. Okay, so we know that we have groups. We know that we have tracks within those groups. Now what we need are keyframes within those tracks. So it's like this hierarchy of stuff you have to add. The first thing we need is our initial keyframe, which is going to control our initial location for our lift. And I'm going to try to be really clever with my screen space here to show you uh, what's going on as best I can. As a matter of fact, uh, if you'll bear with me for just a moment, what I'm going to do is move my window over just a little bit. We'll slide the camera over. I'm going to try to show us everything we possibly can. I'm going to even zoom out a little bit here inside of Matinee so that we can see our entire time range. I think that's probably the best I can hope for at 1024 resolution. Okay, so let's create our initial keyframe. I'm going to click on my movement track to put focus there, and I'm going to click on the little add key button located up here in the toolbar. Just click on that. We get a little tiny burgundy triangle with an orange uh, frame around it, and this is our initial key. Now, some interesting things have just happened. If we take a look here inside the matinee editor, we have a big red key zero indicator telling us what key we are actually sitting at, and something interesting happened here in the viewport. It currently says adjust key zero. Now, if you've done any sort of mover or animation inside of, like, UT 2003 or 4, you've actually seen this kind of thing before, where you get that indicator of uh, you are now animating a mover. It's very similar to that. 
Now, uh, what I'm going to do here is create our second keyframe, because if you know anything about keyframe animation, and even if you don't, the whole idea is that you have at least two keyframes, and you interpolate the change input or in property in between those, and by that you get animation. That's right, and starting out here with the very first keyframe, what that is is recording the position of where this lift is at that particular time, which means, in this case, at time zero, meaning at the start of its animation. That's right, so now let's go all, all the way to the end, three seconds. Notice this is my time slider. This actually tells us what point along our timeline we're, uh, we're looking at over here inside of our sequence. If I drag this to three, notice I can't go beyond that red flag. So that's a flat three seconds. Instead of clicking on the Add Key button, what I'm going to do is press the Enter key, which is a hot key for Add Key. And now I have two keyframes. The only problem is that currently both of these uh, keyframes uh, include the same data. That's right. They both reference the exact same position. So to interpolate between these two, you're not going to see any change on the mover whatsoever. Right. Well, what we're saying in English is at zero seconds, I want you to be on the floor. In three seconds, I still want you to be on the floor. That's right. So that's no good. What I want to do is click on this key, and uh, you'll see Adjust Key 1 on it. Now, just something real quick. If you move your time slider, if you bump it, you'll notice that Adjust Key 1 disappears. We no longer see the key indicator here inside the matinee window, but if I click on that key, boom, it jumps us right over there, and now we see Adjust Key 1, and you want to see that over here inside the window. While Adjust Key 1 is visible here inside the, uh, the viewport, I'm going to take our little uh, widget and drag our lift up into the air, and we get some interesting stuff. First off, we do change position, and we get this really cool line with some little dots along it. And what, these, uh, what this line does is show you the trajectory of the object from its pivot point. So it shows where it begins and where it ends. And the little tiny dots will give you an idea of how quickly it's moving. So you'll notice the dots are really close together at the very beginning. And they spread out as we go along the length, showing us that we are accelerating. And they get close together again at the end, showing us deceleration. And we can confirm that with the animation curve, which is something we'll take a look at very shortly. So now we have some motion. If I scrub the timeline at this point, look at this. Our mover is actually moving. Hey, so if you play forwards, we interpolate from the ground up, and then with it playing backwards, we interpolate from it being up in the air back down to the floor. I'm really glad you said that. Mm. So if you play backwards, the elevator comes back down. That's going to be a really handy trick to keep in mind because if you're completely new to this, you might think, well, I animated the lift going up. I suppose now I should animate it going back down. And the truth is you don't. All you That's need right. to do is animate it backwards in reverse. But It's kind of like hitting the, the play backwards button or kind of like the rewind button. And what that's going to do is make our lift animate backwards back down to the ground. Okay, so uh, with that, let's go ahead and take a look at trying this lift out. We've got all of our key stuff in place. I'll close down the uh, Unreal Matinee Editor, and we get a little autosave in there. That was nice. And uh, we will right-click on the floor, and we have a problem. I'm going to warn you ahead of time that we got a problem. Gee, and Zach, something tells me it's just not going to work. It's not, and it could be really frustrating if you're completely new to this. So there's our little black plate on the floor. Again, notice it's not being lit because none of the lights in our scene are broadcasting on the dynamic channel. But if I walk over to it... We get nothing. I jump up and down on it, you know, shoot it a couple times. That doesn't help. Nothing seems to be helping. We can't actually make this work. Also notice that our light apparently casts a dynamic light. So for just a second, we can see that plate. So what's going on? What's the problem? When you bring in this interp actor, because again, that's all it is. It said mover, but a mover is an interp actor that's already got a little matinee network created for it. Uh, this uh, interp actor has no collision attributes. So by default, it has no idea that the player's standing on it. In order to fix that, we need to double-click on this uh, interp actor. Let me go ahead and just collapse all of our uh, little menus here. I'm going to expand our collision category, and you'll see collision type. Oh, there you go. Currently set to collide, no collision. Let's go ahead and set this to block all. We'll close this down and right-click on the floor and jump back to play from here. And let's see what we get. Something much better. Whoop. Hey! We go up into the air. That's still kind of slow for a lift. And then we wait, and then we come back down. Oh, we came back down. We did. We came back it's down. It's clever. Somehow it knew how to play in reverse. That's right. Now, that's all part of the uh, automatic network that came in as part of the mover. And we that's can, right. We can confirm that if we jump back into Kismet and really analyze these connections that came in with our mover event. First off, pawn attach, which basically says, hey, is somebody standing on this thing and uh, thereby attaching themselves to it? If so, hit the play button. 
Now, then it says, open finished, hit reverse. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means we have played all the way through to the end. And take a look. If we select the, uh, the event, we have stay open time. And look at the tooltip for it. It's great. Let me actually bring it back up so maybe I have time to read it. Uh, it's going to say how long the mover should stay open before automatically closing reverse playback. And then it gives you a little idea of uh, how the values actually work on it. So very, very handy feature there. If we wanted to change this to something really short, like maybe uh, 0.5 seconds, we just change the stay open time to half a second. Let's go ahead and minimize Kismet for a second. I'll give this another quick so test. Now it should go up, and as soon as it gets up, it's, gonna, it's just going to be a very slight pause and go back down. Half a second wait, slight pause, and then boom, on its way down. Going back down. So there we go. Let's go ahead and get out of there, and we'll jump back into Unreal Kismet. Now, also, we have Hit Actor set to Change Direction. That's another very uh, interesting input. Let's go ahead and demonstrate what that means. If we come in and play one more time, I'm going to just run over this to push it up into the air, and then we'll stand right under it, and here it comes. Bump. Bump. <laughs> it detects the player, and then it jumps back up into the air. In fact, let me bring down the console, and we'll do the old... Uh, behind view one bit, and then we can watch this thing come down and just keep hitting the player in the head over and over. Thunk. <laughs> so there's a, a quick look at that. Whenever it sees the player, when it comes in contact That's with something right. underneath it, it's going to change direction and, and end up us. playing back to the uh, and the other way. So let's open Kismet back up, and let's open up the matinee uh, editor, and now let's diverge away from actually doing stuff, and let's talk a little bit about the editor and its user interface. Actually, if you don't mind, let's have just a little bit more fun. You okay. said that it takes three seconds to get up, three seconds to get back down, half right. a second at the top, a little too long to get up. If we wanted to speed that up, Let's edit it real quick. Let's, sure, let's, absolutely. Let's have it take a second and a half to get up. No problem, but you've got to think about what it is you're trying to accomplish there. You want the exact same range of motion that you, wanted, uh, that you had taking place there, but you want it to happen in less time. That's right. In terms of the timeline, that means along a, lo a shorter portion of the timeline. Exactly. So that's how you've got to translate it in your head. So what I can do is I can select this second keyframe. I can hold down control, and this is a very common uh, action that you'll find in a lot of the different editors inside of Unreal. If you want to move something, you have to hold control, because if you're not holding control, it thinks you want to look around. So we'll hold control, and we'll drag this key. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, I've got snapping turned on, so I get these nice, precise jumps. We'll drag this down to 1.5 seconds, but that doesn't really do it, because if I play this right now, what's going to happen is our lift is indeed going to go up into the air over a second and a half, but then we're going to get this other one and a half second pause before, the, uh, before Unreal realizes that our animation is over. So in a sense, it's adding a one and a half second uh, pause to the top of the lift, which we don't want. That's right. So I'm going to take our end time and we'll drag that. Also notice that's pushing my time slider in, which is kind of convenient. So boom, there we go. It also pushed that second green arrow in. Nothing can go beyond the red flag. So think of it like an extent to your animation. So there you go. We have the exact same motion taking place just over a shorter amount of time. Let me go ahead and zoom us in a little bit so that we're uh, still using as much of the screen as we possibly can. And I'll close Unreal Matinee. We'll close the Kismet Editor, and let's test this out. You're going to see that we now get up much faster than we did a second ago. What? And then a little pause. Oh. Very nice, very nice. There you go. So let's go ahead and get out of here, and we'll jump back into Kismet, expand our Interp Actor 7, and I'll open up our matinee window. Okay. So with this, I think we are ready to <laughs> take a look at the user interface. Anything else you want to squeeze in real quick? <sighs> no, not really. Okay. We, we can do some stuff after we're done with this. Yes, we can. We shall be having fun with curbs in just a minute. Yes, take your ve we got to eat your vegetables, and then we'll get back to our dessert after that. So uh, at the very top of the matinee window, we have a menu bar, which contains the file menu with import and export. And what you are importing will be Collada files. Uh, in specifics, this is uh, intended for bringing in camera animation from such programs as 3ds Max. So if you've already created a very cool cinematic sequence, say, over in Max with animated characters and whatnot, this can be a very handy feature to uh, help you bring that animated camera uh, information in so that you can use it inside of Unreal. So that you don't have to go through trying to create the exact camera animation inside of Unreal itself. That's right. Now, moving over from here, we have the edit menu, which has a whole lot of stuff in it. First off, it has undo and redo, two very important features that I use uh, very regularly. <laughs> Down from here, we have... Uh, so, okay, I'm going to try to generalize this section, and then we'll talk about what it does. This section has some commands that you can perform with this little green section in mind, if I can get my uh, cursor right on that and drag it around. So you'll notice these two little green uh, arrows are controlling the overall size of this section. 
And a lot of these commands have to do with this. This is actually called several things. Uh, uh, strangely enough, it's not really consistent how it's named inside the editor. Uh, it is, I think, overall it's called the loop section, but you'll hear it referred to as the section. You'll uh, see it referred to as the sequence. It all means the same thing. It's this area of green stuff. So if we come over here, we have insert space at current. And what that's going to do is allow us to insert some more time at, at our timeline. So, like, if we're right here, maybe we got a lot of keyframes in here, we want to push all of our keyframes to the right over so that we can get some more space. Uh, we can do that by going to Edit, Insert Space at Current, and it says, well, how much time would you like to insert? Maybe a second. Now, this is not something that we'd really need to worry about in the case of a lift, but if we had a much more complex animation, say some sort of camera animation, and we're thinking, you know, I need an extra second of time in here to work in some more keyframes, well, that's how you can do it. You can insert it, and it'll push everything over for you. Down from here, we have stretch section. Now, here we go. We're working with that section directly. Any keyframes that we have in here uh, will be stretched out. Now, I guess it'd probably be prudent for me to add some keyframes to this point. So uh, let's go ahead, and I'm just going to press Enter. Oh, we have no track selected, so that's a nice warning. It just says, hey, you need to select a track before you can add a keyframe. Let's do it. We'll select the movement track, and I'm just going to press Enter and Enter. Now, these keyframes aren't doing anything particular. They're just here for sake of example. So notice, they, though, that they are within the, uh, the section loop, the little green area. Let's also make one that's not inside of that, just for uh, sake of argument. Now, let's go back to Edit, and I'll say Stretch Section. How long would you like to stretch it? It says uh, its new length is going to be what? Currently, its length is half a second, which we can confirm from 0.5 to 1. So there's its current length. What length would we like it to have? Maybe 0.75. Uh, and it stretches everything out. Also, notice it has pushed out the overall length of our animation to accommodate that. So this is like keyframe scaling, if you're familiar with the process. Let's go ahead and bring our overall time back down to one and a half seconds. Now, down from here, we have delete section. So any keys that fall within our section will get nuked, and something else will, interesting will happen. Boom, it shortened out our entire animation. In this case, that's a problem, because it leaves a little floating keyframe out here. Actually, that keyframe was floating out there right after you did that last operation, but the nice thing is it just pulled that keyframe back, so now if you scale up to one, dink. Back, oh, 1.5, okay. Right, and then all we need to do is again, just move it. Yeah, just move this keyframe back over to 1.5. Yeah. So there's just a quick look at that. What you're doing is you're chopping out whatever was inside the section, and you're bringing the remainder back over and slamming it up against the, uh, the right. new hole. So you're making sure there's no holes in your animation. Let's go back over here. We have select keys in section. So let me take this little key, and I'm just going to move it over here into the section, and then we'll deselect it. So if I go select keys in section, boom, he gets selected. Any other keys that were also in this section would get selected. For now, though, I'm just going to delete him out. So I, I just selected the key and pressed the delete key. Down from here, we have duplicate selected keys. I guess I should make some more keys for us to play with. So uh, let's go ahead and I'll just uh, grab my movement track. We'll press Enter and Enter. So there's a couple of keys. This also allows me to show you just kind of one thing off to the side. If I hold down Control and select two keys at once, we get the space in between them and the overall amount of time uh, that takes place in between them. Very, very handy. I actually, uh, in, uh, as I'm using Matinee, I thought to myself, you know, I wish Maya had that. <laughs> But anyways, so uh, let's move on from here. We uh, have duplicate selected keys. Notice these two keys are selected, and boom, we get a duplicate of them. Also slightly offset so we can see where the duplicates are, so we can move those over if we wanted to. I'm just going to go ahead and delete them out. And under, uh, back under Edit, we have Save as Path Building Positions. Now, this is something that I had to kind of discuss conceptually for just a minute, so bear with me. Uh, if you are familiar, even if you're not familiar, with animating bots around your levels inside of Unreal, it requires the use of path nodes. And these path nodes are like little indicators that tell your bots where they can and can't go within reason. And there's a catch to that where doors come into play. If you have a door that's closed, then the system that builds these paths that go between your nodes looks at that door like a wall, and you, you can't get through it. And this is where the uh, save as path building positions and jump to path building positions comes in really, really handy, because you can take the door and uh, m go to the part of your, uh, an your animated sequence where the door is open, and you can save that point out as a path building position. That way, when you're building paths, the door will automatically open and paths can be built through the door. And then for some reason, if you just need to double check that, you can jump to the path building position and double check, hey, is my door actually open, or is this going to uh, be a problem for building those path nodes. So just, you know, stuff to keep in mind. Not something I can readily demonstrate here, but uh, that should be enough for you to understand what it does. Next, we have bind editor hotkeys. 
If you hit this, you get a list of all the hotkeys that are available inside a matinee. Very handy. So there's a big, long list of them, and you can rebind them to anything you want. Uh, I still don't know them all, <laughs> and which is interesting for me because I love hotkeys. Now, down from here, we have the Curve Editor hotkeys as well. So there's some uh, cool stuff there. And, again, you can rebind all those if you need to. You can uh, save these out as different configurations and then load up configurations. So maybe you bring your favorite key configuration over on a flash drive. You can load it in here. And then, uh, of course, reset to default if you've gone through and messed some stuff up. So let's go ahead and close that out. And moving over from here, we have the View menu. This starts off with Hide 3D Tracks. And it, honestly, the very first time I ever, ever saw this in Matinee, I had no idea what this did for a very long time. But what this does, you see this little three-dimensional path? If we come back over here and choose Hide 3D Tracks, that goes away. And at the time when I was trying to figure out what this menu option did, the first time I ever looked at this, my camera was looking away for some reason, and I just didn't notice it. So that's all it does. It just gets rid of that, uh, that trajectory. We have Zoom to Scrub Position. I like leaving this on. Some people don't agree with me because I think if this is off, your zoom gets a little arbitrary. But if we turn it off and I put the, uh, maybe just right about here in the center of my screen, I just zoom into whatever I'm looking at. So you'll notice it's going in toward the center. If I was to navigate us over here, we're zooming in at this point, and so on and so forth. If you switch zoom to scrub position on, as soon as we uh, manipulate the scroll wheel, we're jumping in toward the time slider. That's really all that's doing. It just okay. comes down to preference and how you yeah, like to yeah, work. Yeah, how you like to work. That's all it boils down to. Now, here's where stuff gets kind of interesting, because uh, I think if I'm not so much mistaken, these next two commands are actually out of order. They do the exact opposite of what they say they do. Uh, first off, we have fit loop. Now, if I hit this, bump, we are fitting our whole sequence into our view. We're zooming perfectly into the sequence. But if I go to fit sequence, we're actually fitting to the loop. So they're perfectly in reverse to one another. However, there's uh, just off the cuff, there's some tool buttons we'll talk about in a second. These do work the way they should, even though they supposedly tie up here to these. Basically, in your head, just reverse the names here. This should be view fit sequence. This should be view fit loop. They're perfectly backwards. Then we have view fit loop sequence, and this does something that I didn't expect at all when you click on it. It zooms us in to the length of the sequence, and then it takes our uh, section and spreads it out to take up the entire sequence. So it just kind of does everything at so once. So it indeed meets both of those criteria. <laughs> it, except that it changes, it, yeah, it forces it, it to where, yeah, yeah it right. has to. It's <laughs> kind of interesting. Now here's also another interesting feature of the matinee editor. We can toggle on the curve editor. Now, why I say that's interesting is because uh, if you go over to the window menu, which is our next menu, the very first thing is Unreal Matinee Curve Editor. So if you didn't get enough of it there, you can also make it visible here. But these two will conflict with each other. So if I turn it on here and I turn it on here, I've got to turn it back off here to switch it off. Right. So they kind of override one another. Okay, and also we have the ability to turn the properties window on and off as well. So that's a quick look at the menu bar. Now let's jump down to the toolbar. We've already kind of seen this button. This allows us to add a key. I prefer just using the enter key, but for those of you who uh, aren't big hotkey fans, of course you've got this little button up here. Refer back to it if you want to. We have the ability to control the kind of key we want to make. Now, in the case of this mover, I don't believe it was really working that way, so I'm just going to confirm this real quick. Uh, don't pay any attention to what I'm doing. Yeah, we don't have constant keys in there. So this was set to constant, but that was indeed not what it was doing. The purpose of this drop-down is to allow you to uh, control what types of keys you want to create. So do you want to create linear keys which have no ease in and ease out? Uh, do you want to create auto keys which will ease in and ease out? Now, uh, these are terms that I'm using that assume a little bit of knowledge of keyframe animation. So for now, if you don't know much about keyframe animation, I am sorry. Uh, it will make a little more sense once I go through the discussion of the curve editor. So for in now, just a minute. Yeah, in just a minute. So bear with me. Uh, but if you are familiar with uh, an keyframe animation and animation curves, Bege curves for animation, then you already know what these are going to do. Okay, so moving on from here, we have play. Uh, this is just going to play through once, and it's done. But it's very handy, because as we're playing through, you can watch back in the editor, and you can see the objects actually move around. That's right, but if you hit play again, it's not rewinding, so you need to hit stop to rewind it, and then play again. And there you go. You can watch it. Now, you do have play loop, and this is kind of interesting, because it's loop section. So right now, it just so happens, coincidentally, that I am looping the entire animation over and over. But that is because my little green section is taking up my entire animation. So if there was a part of the animation I wanted to analyze and play over and over again to see if it's playing right, I can set my section down like so, and then when I click uh, loop section, we're just playing that one portion. 
there's a, just a, a quick overview of that. Let's go ahead and stop that. Also, just uh, off the side, let me go ahead and delete these excess keyframes. They're not doing us any good, so I'll select them, press the delete key, and nuke those out. All right, next to the here, we have several buttons that allow us to control playback speed. In most cases, I will always leave this set to full speed, but for maybe some sort of debugging purposes, you might want to set this down to slower speeds just to see how stuff looks. Like if we're thinking maybe our lift is moving a little too quickly, we can set this down to half speed and hit play. And one, you know, does that look better? If so, do we need to increase the uh, overall speed of our animation or decrease it and so on and so forth? It's just a way to control playback speed. That's all it is. We'll leave it at 100. Next to this, we have undo and redo. Uh, pretty cut and dry with those do. This will undo. This will redo anything that has been undone. Uh, next to this, we have the ability to toggle the curve editor on. If you didn't get enough of that feature from the view and window menus, you can also do it from the toolbar. So, boom, there it is. We can toggle snapping. I like this, and I use it all the time, because in general, most of my animations, especially for lifts and doors and all that, uh, round to some nice... Uh, friendly interval. I don't think I ever uh, animate doors to something like 2.315 seconds. So uh, if you need those nice big round figures, just snap to anything you like. Next to this, you have a snap list, and this is great. I love the tooltip for this. Snack, uh, selects the timeline granularity that keys will be snapped, and that's exactly what it does. It's just put so well. Uh, you have frames per second you can select. You can snap directly to keys, and really, in general, what I use is the percentages of a second. Uh, it just seems to me that's the most convenient way to work. Now over uh, here we have the view fit, view fit loop, and view fit loop sequence buttons. Now these actually work the way you'd think they should. Uh, if we click on view fit sequence, boom, the sequence jumps into uh, our view. If we do view fit loop, we snap into the actual uh, loop section. And then if we do view fit loop sequence, boom, we get exactly what we had before, which is that the, uh, the loop is stretched out to the whole of our sequence and we zoom into the whole thing. So there you go. There's the toolbar. Now, moving down from here, I'm going to start off on the left-hand side. We have the group track list. That is what this is called, and that's exactly what it does. It contains groups, and it contains tracks. Now, a quick word about that. A group can contain multiple tracks, and in many cases it will contain multiple tracks, and we'll get to see more of that as we progress through these videos. Up above our list of groups and tracks are some filters that we can add in to help us select certain things, so any cameras we have, and currently we have none, so everything kind of disappears, or skeletal meshes we can make uh, appear just by clicking on these buttons. Another thing, though, I did want to kind of bring up before I forget, because I will forget if I'm not careful, is if you right-click here in the group track list, you have your creation section where you can create an empty group, you can create a camera group, a particle group, and we'll talk a little bit more about these as we go through these videos. But I did want to mention this, and it's the ability to add a new folder. If I add a folder, it's going to ask for a folder name, and let's call this the uh, lift folder. And this is just an organizational system. Uh, the folder itself doesn't really do anything. It's just there to contain groups. And to move groups into it, you have two options. You can right-click on the group, and you'll see Move Group Into Folder, and you'll get a list of all your folders here. So there we go. It jumps into the lift folder. And the cool thing is I can collapse this folder and make all that go away. So a very nice organizational feature. I can expand that back out. If I need to pull it back out of the folder, we can right-click on the group again and remove from folder. And there we go. So now it's, it's separate, but the folder's been moved up to the top. It's no longer contained within it, though. I can right-click on the folder itself and you say, move group into this folder. Well, what group? The movie, mover group. Move that in there like so. Or we can right-click on the folder, and all we can do from here is rename the folder or delete it. And watch this when you delete it. You get a very nice warning. Are you sure you want to delete this folder? Any groups that are attached will be detached first, but not deleted. So we'll say yes, and that just nukes out the folder. So and that's very handy to make sure you don't accidentally kill a bunch of work you've set up. Oh, I'd cry. <laughs> I, I'd just sob for an hour. So a uh, very nice feature. If you get into a single matinee uh, sequence that has a whole lot of different things animated doing different stuff, you might want to really consider keeping things sorted into folders just to keep your head straight. All right, uh, you will notice that there is a scroll bar over here on the left-hand side. Now, here I have nothing really to scroll, but as you start adding more and more groups and tracks, this will become more and more important, and the ability to scroll up and down and see all of your different groups and tracks becomes very important. 
One more thing I want to bring up while we're in here, and we will see this in a future video, but I want to make sure you're exposed to it right away, is there is a very uh, specific kind of group you can add called a director group, and this has to do with working with the camera. Think of it. What, is, what does a film director do on the set of a movie? He's all about the shot. He's all about what the cameras are going to be doing. That's why he's there, and that's why the director group is here as well. But when we add it, the user interface does something really interesting. It divides into two. And all of our director group stuff is placed on top, and all of our other groups, basically any other groups that have nothing to do with the cameras, are placed down here below. And each one of these has their own scrollability. I just wanted to make sure you saw that. All right, so moving, uh, let's just jump over to the right. We have the main timeline. And you've already been looking at this. This shows us all of our track information, all of the keyframes that are within our tracks. Notice that keyframes will generally appear as a little burgundy triangle that gets a nice orange highlight when selected. Uh, based on the kind of tracks that you have, uh, these will appear a little, well, the tracks will appear a little bit differently based on what you're doing. So like a soundtrack, for example, which is something you can add. We could right-click on this group, and it should let let us add a soundtrack, though I'm not really going to add one, but, uh, okay, fine, I will. But uh, <laughs> if you uh, try to add a key to a soundtrack, when you press enter, we'll get a warning that says we need a sound cue selected. Now, I'm not going to go digging out a sound cue, but if we did, we could place a key, and we would actually see the length of that sound clip here inside this track. So all sorts of information will actually be displayed in this timeline based on what you're doing. Okay, so uh, moving down from there, we have the time indicator. This tells you where your time slider is along your entire duration and the length of the duration, which in this case is 1.5 seconds, and we are at 0.198 seconds. So as we slide around, we can see that update. As we, if we were to take our overall duration and change it, you can see the number on the right also update as well. And again, we're snapping to keep things nice and clean. Okay, and uh, to the right of this, we have the main timeline and the range slider. Now, if we drag on the timeline, what we're doing is we're moving that, uh, that time slider. That's really mm -hmm. all we're doing. But this little white guy down here underneath, this gives us an overall range slider that we can drag back and forth to get some panning action. And just kind of an interesting thing, if you drag it just off the screen and hold it there, you'll truck along. So if I drag it over here and hold it, we truck back. Also notice, if you zoom out, this guy gets really, really big, and if you zoom really, really close in, he gets really, really small. So it's kind of like a percentage slider to show you where you are along the timeline. Very easy way to navigate, though in general, just me personally, I don't think I ever really use him. Uh, in most cases, I will just click and drag here inside the main timeline, not down here, but up here in the, the green area, and just move around that way. That's just personal preference. Now, down from here, we have the properties area. This will change based on what type of track you have selected. Notice for movement, we have all sorts of interesting stuff. We have angle, curve, tension, hide the 3D track, which, by the way, uh, we had that option available up here inside view. We had hide 3D tracks. If you set it up here, it sets it for all different groups that are part of this matinee sequence. But if you want to change that on a track-by-track -track basis, then we can turn it off just for this movement track. And if we had any other movement tracks in here, we'd still see their, their uh, trajectory. So it's just a way to switch those on and off. Uh, show arrow at keys, and a whole bunch of little things, and most of them will tell you uh, either just by name or by the very handy tooltip what's going on here. So that is a quick look at the matinee user interface. Minus the curve editor, which we're going to play with now. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, let's jump in there. Do you know why I forgot? Why'd because you forget? Because it's not there. I mean, you, you don't <laughs> see it out of sight completely. Well, it was mind. there a minute ago. You brought it up, didn't so, you? Quickly hit it away. Let me do this. We're going to take our director group, and I'm going to delete it out. Goodbye. And that's going to set us back to just a basic list of groups. Okay. I'm also not going to be using this soundtrack, so let's delete that. So we're just killing out things we're not using. Also, I'm going to click this little box, which will become pertinent here in just a moment, and let's bring up the toggle curve editor. So when you first bring this up, it's going to be empty. So what we're going to do now, Zach, is we're going to throttle back just a little bit sure. for people out there that are completely new to working with keyframe animation. Oh, do we have to? Yes, we have to. Okay, so what is keyframe animation? Well, we hinted to it already. Keyframe animation is basically us storing a particular value for a property. In our particular case, we're dealing with a location, for 
our little plate that we're using mm-hmm. as our mover, our lift. We're storing that information at a particular spot in time. And the way we deal with time in Unreal is the time from which the sequence is fired off. Mm-hmm. So we store that first keyframe at 0.00, meaning the instant that the sequence is fired, this first key holds where it should be, yep. which is, well, on the ground. And then we interpolate, meaning that the value of that position changes as it reaches the position that's stored in the next keyframe, which in our particular case here is stored at 1.5 seconds after the sequence is fired off. So the lift will interpolate up to that position, which is up in the air where we placed it. But now, let's take a look at how we can control that interpolation. What takes place between the keyframes? I'm going to play good cop, bad cop, because that was like the really technical explanation. So here's the really general explanation. (laughs) We said, when the animation starts, be on the floor. 1.5 1.5 seconds later, be in the air. That's right. And the computer does all the work in between, and that work is called interpolation. And we can control that. That's right. More importantly, that interpolation can be represented via a curve. Mm-hmm. So let's take a look at that. Now, in order to actually use the curve editor, you need to send uh, some sort of animation curve up to it. So here I have a movement track, which indeed does have an animation on it. We've confirmed that. And I have this little tiny black box, and if I click on it, it's going to send this curve up. And boom, this guy comes to life and gets some interesting stuff in it. To make this a little easier to see, let's go ahead and hide out our properties pane at the bottom. Okay. Well, let's click a little close box, and then we'll stretch this guy out just a little bit. So I think we're making the most of our user interface at this point. Now, here's the thing. We can't really see too much of what's going on here. We need to kind of stretch things out. And we have the ability to fit our animation curves into our view. And, uh, you know, we can do that manually, but it's so much fun to do it automatically. So (laughs) let's click horizontally and click vertically. And, ooh, we get this stuff that looks like we're back in algebra class or or, uh, even calculus class. And actually, believe it or not, it is more akin to calculus (laughs) But uh, it's very simple what's going on here. We are taking the changes in position, and we are representing them graphically. And what I'm going to do real quick is just go one axis at a time and show you what's going on. Now, when I say one axis at a time, take a look over here inside my curve uh, icon here in the list. We see red, we see green, and we see blue. And if you're already not familiar with that, RGB equals XYZ. So red is always going to be X, Y is always going to be green, or green is always going to be Y, and uh, blue is always going to be the Z axis. Now, in what direction are we moving this lift? Straight up and down. That is the Z-axis. So uh, let's just go one axis at a time, though. I'm going to click on blue. I'm going to click on green. And all we have left is red. Notice that it's flatlined. There is nothing going on here. We're saying at the beginning of our animation, we have uh, this particular value, which is negative 180 by the look of it. And then 1.5 seconds later, at the end of our animation, we have the same value. So no motion in X. So let's turn off X. And so that's correct, because the lift is only moving straight up. There is no movement in X. That's That's right. right. It's only moving in In Z. Z. That's right. So let's take a look at Y for a second, and we get the same thing. We get its uh, Y position, which is 324 Unreal units at the beginning of the animation, and it's still 324 units later on. Now, why am I showing you this? Well, again, we're assuming that you're relatively new to the world of keyframe animation, and whenever you see a perfectly flat line, that indicates no animation. You like no to think change. of that as a hold. That's right. Uh, or a hold. I always think of it as flatlining. That's, that's just the way <laughs> I've always looked at it. But, I mean, yeah, hold is when I'm trying to uh, hold that key up to a certain degree. I, I, know, I know what you're coming yeah, from. Yeah, we don't want it to move, so it's holding you know, it's holding still. That's right. So let me go ahead and turn that off, and let's take a look at our Z curve. Ooh, Z has some change over time. And we can see that at the beginning of the animation, we are at a value of negative 248, and one and a half seconds later, and we can't really see that, so I'm going to navigate our window over just by left-clicking and dragging, we are now at a value of 116 Unreal units. But take a look at what happened in between. We get this nice fluid curve, and this curve is what Unreal, uh, what the Unreal Engine is using to get that change to occur over time. Right, that curve is what's driving the actual change of the Z position on our plate. Now, if you remember way back to when we first saw that 3D track that showed what our lift was doing, you saw you know it kind of uh, had those dots on it, mm-hmm. which I said showed that it was speeding up. Yeah, and more dots back down. pushed together at the beginning, at the end, and they were more spaced apart. There you go. So yep. the dots are really close together, then they space apart, and then they go 
back together again. And I told you that that indicates that we are accelerating and then decelerating. That's also reflected here in the curve. If you graph this out with change over time, we start off at this particular value. And after, let's say, well, I guess if this is 0.5 seconds, this would be about 0.1. After about 0.1, we haven't really changed much. Right. But 0.1 seconds later, we've got a lot more change. And 0.1 after that, a lot more change. So our curve is getting steeper. Steeper curves mean faster motion. So we are accelerating. We reach about a constant rate in between about 0.5 and 1. Not much change taking place there. Kind of a constant rate of motion. Yeah, there's change taking place, but, but the slope is not yeah, changing. It's just not much. Yeah, there, there's change of, uh, of value, That's right. but not change of rate. That's right. We're not, we are uh, not really accelerating very much, nor are we decelerating very much. Now, after we get past one second, our slope begins to change. It starts to flatten back out. Now, remember earlier I said that flat lines equal no animation. So what we're doing here is we're decelerating back down to our, uh, our actual value. And we can see that in the motion of our uh, lift. If we go ahead and play the loop, you can actually, if you look closely, you can see it speeds up and then it slows back down right before it gets to the top. So that's a, a quick look at uh, how curves are automatically created. Now, the cool thing is, is that we can control these curves. This, uh, this is not hard locked down. We have all sorts of ability to change the shape of this curve, and by doing that, to change the nature of our animation. So in this case, I'm just going to leave our Z curve visible. We don't really need to see X or Y. And uh, let's jump over from here. If I select one of these curves, which uh, actually I guess before we go any further I should talk about navigating this window. I know I'm trying to, I'm trying not to jump around too much, <clears throat> excuse me. If I left click and drag as you've already seen, we can uh, navigate around this window. If I uh, right click, I get nothing, so really all you're doing here is just moving around. If you need to zoom in and out in general, I use the scroll wheel. But notice here, we're in pan mode. We can jump over to zoom mode, and if I use this, I can zoom just vertically with the left mouse button and I can zoom just horizontally with the right mouse button. Now this is great if you need to change the scope of your graph in one dimension or another. You're not really changing the shape of this curve, you're just changing how it is visually represented to you. And often that's very important to give you a better perspective of what is taking place with change. That's right. And don't forget, at any point you can just fit these right to your screen. So fit horizontally, fit vertically, and still get a nice look at that curve. So let's go ahead and jump back over to pan mode because if I don't, I will accidentally nudge this and zoom things. And if I select one of these keys just by clicking on it, so you can see a selection, we get a little bit of a, a little white bar here. I'll talk about there in just a second. Let me get done talking about selection. I can hold down control and I can select multiple uh, key, vis uh, key frames or keys at once. I can hold control and alt and I can marquee select. So if I want to select them all at the same time, there we go. So there's a, a quick look at selection. But while these keys are selected, I get a whole bunch of buttons that come to life, and these allow us to control what types of keys we want to use. Now, what does that mean? I mean, do, how, do, how do keys have different types? Well, these different types of keys control the, the type of interpolation you get from one key to the next. By default, you have an automatic key. That means that Unreal will control it, and it's going to keep things very flat. That's where you'll get this sort of uh, accelerate out and decelerate as you come in kind of look. Ease in and ease out. Ease in and ease out. Exactly right. I have the ability to switch these over to user curves, and it looks like nothing happens. But when you're in a user curve, you suddenly have the ability, if I just select this uh, key by itself, to take this little handle and change it. And notice what that handle actually is representing. It's representing the direction that the curve is taking as it leaves that key. So as I bring it down, look what our curve is doing. It's actually dipping down. What sort of motion does this define? It means that our lift would actually go down into the floor for a moment and then start to raise back up. And we can show that. Actually. Let's just take just a second and confirm that. If I uh, just hit play loop. <laughs> Where did it go? <laughs> yeah, it'll, it's going to shoot down through the floor for a second and seem to disappear. So if you drag your scrubber over there... You can actually show them slowly. Yeah, let me stop it, and we'll bring this to... Right, there you go. You can watch it go right down through the floor. So if I play back down and then back up. There you go. So you can see that motion clearly defined right here. In fact, let me try to get... I'll try to make the most out of our camera by showing us the whole thing, or as much as I possibly can. I think that's probably about the best I can hope for. So we can control this curve by adjusting these tangents, like right here. We have accelerating as we leave the curve, instant, like rocketing straight up out of there, and then we slow down as we get to the top. So if I hit play, boom, and then slow down as we get up to the top. 
So you can use this to really get a lot of different looks to your animation, though admittedly, in the case of a lift, the very simple ease in, ease out is probably one of the best ones you can hope for. Now, at the same time, we have uh, other forms as well. Ooh, before I jump on, I want to show you this. Notice I've set this uh, key to an auto curve, so it got nice and ease in, ease out style again. We get that nice S-curve shape. As soon as I grab this handle and try to adjust it, look what happened up there in the top toolbar. We immediately jumped over to a user curve. Unreal said, oh, you want to be able to edit that as, you know, on your own? That has to be a user key type, so it shifts it over for you. Okay, our next key type is the uh, curve break. Now, the only way I can really show this off is to put a key right here in the middle of this. You need a key that has uh, a key that the curve will enter and then exit. That's going to be the... And right now, with the only two keys we have, we only have an exit from one and an enter on the other. That's right. So what I'm going to do is move my time slider to the center of the animation. Let's make sure that my, uh, my track is selected, and I'll press enter. And that creates a new key for us right here that I can select. So we'll click on that. Now, notice this guy actually has two separate handles. And as I move one around, the other one comes with it. And we can start to get some really funky looks to the curve. <laughs> oh, yeah, leave it like that. Because that will demonstrate going up and above, then slowing down and going back, then slowing down, then going back up to the top. That's right. So notice the timeline just moves forward. We go up into the air. We level off. We come back down. We level off. And we go up into the air. Okay, I can't help it. We've got to show this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, just here's a quick note, too. If you try to play in the editor, matinee must close, so you'll click yes, and this, okay, it's pre-caching. Let's give it a second to, to go ahead and do that. We must have done something important. Yeah, what do you know? <laughs> there we go. Now, this is actually what I wanted to show. If matinee is open, in a lot of cases, the play-in editor will immediately go away. So let's go ahead and try this out again. So, boom. There we go. So it's, it's loading up. Here we are. Now, if we stand on this, this is great. Up, down, up. Down, up, down. <laughs> so it's like the kookiest lift in the world, if you just really want to irritate your players for some reason. All right, let's go back into... That really does help demonstrate by adjusting these tangent handles on these keyframes what's taking place, how it's affecting change of that object over time. Oh, really, sh definitely you know, sh driving home that kind of control that you can really get out of this. Now, uh, with that in mind, let's move on to the rest of the lecture. We have the curve break key type. And if I activate this for this particular key, I can now take these handles and put them in two different directions. And now we can do some break, ne break neck stuff. Oh, yeah, this is really cool. I mean, in general, this would throw you off. It would be like a, a <laughs> bucking plate. So it would take you up into the air. It's going to immediately change direction. Yeah, very abrupt. And, in fact, let me go ahead and just play the loop. Boom. Oh. It's almost like it hits something right there, like a bounce. Very nice. And then it continues up. And I, I could demonstrate that one, too, in the game, but we won't. It was so much fun, though. So uh, if we want to put that back together, of course, we can set this back over to auto tangents. There's another way to uh, put to uh, realign those as well, but I'll actually show that here in just a minute. Now, from here, we have linear. And uh, really, to show this off, what I need to do is start off by uh, having this guy kind of flatten back out. So you'll notice just from the middle key to the end key, we've got this, uh, again, ease out and ease back in style look. What I'm going to do is select this key and our end key by holding control, and I'm going to set them both to linear because this will really help drive the point home. Boom. We get a linear line, a straight line in between the two points. And in general, whenever you see... Actually, there's no in general to it. I'm sorry. Whenever you see this inside of keyframe animation, it means animation that takes place at a constant rate of motion. It is neither accelerating nor That's is it right. decelerating. From start to the ending point. Constant. That's right. So uh, from here, we and then you, when you say constant, you just confuse people because we have the <laughs> constant key type. And this is, uh, in a lot of different animation packages, this has different names. Uh, I've heard it called, called hold keys before. Step. Step to uh, step tangents. So let's go ahead and just uh, activate this on both of these keys and check out and what we get. It is constant. It's going to hold the value constant. There is no change at all. And then there is a abrupt, an immediate change. Yeah, now watch, let's watch this. This one's great. So it goes up into the air, holds, and then snap. You don't what? even see it because it takes place at the very end. It's there for one frame. <laughs> yeah, so here's what I'm going to do. We're going to... Uh, we can go in-game for that one for an instant snap if you want to close that out. Oh, uh, I actually, that it's just going to look like a jitter on the screen. Well... Because we're going to pop in the beginning right down to the very end. And we're not going to get a small hold at the top? Oh, we will. Okay, yeah, our right. closing here. time. Okay. Yeah, we can do you that. Let's go, go ahead. Let me close matinee first. And then what I'll do is I'll show you the actual blink that we can visualize. We'll turn our uh, our lift into a, like a simple teleporter. 
So here we go. A well, partial and then, instant snap. Yeah, funny little jitter on the screen, and then we, we pop back down. Yeah, we've got our, our time at the top at like 0.5 seconds, so we sat up there for half a second. All right, so let's jump back into matinee. Now, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to take this key for just a moment. I'm going to delete it. I'll probably end up recreating it later. But uh, let's zoom out. I'm going to take both of our keys, and uh, let's see. actually, I probably need a key right here that I can hold to. So bear with me while I set up a quick animation. We're going to grab our movement track, and I'll press enter. But check this out. I'm going to move this key upwards. Now, what does this actually mean? I'm increasing the value of this key. So we are moving uh, up to our full height here earlier on in the animation. Again, we're just, we have time and we have value, so I'm just changing the value. So let me grab all of our keys at once with a marquee selection, and I'll set them all over to constant. Now this is where stuff gets fun, so uh, let's close this out. We'll close this, oh, sorry, wrong button. Okay, and uh, let's play from here. And I'll just show you what this does. Pink. It's almost like a teleporter. Yep. The other, the other step was there. I don't know if you noticed. It was just a very quick... It was just a little, little baby step right yeah. at the very, very top. And let's take a quick look at our, uh, our curve and just show you exactly what's going on here. So we're holding for a few seconds. We're immediately jumping to our new location. We're holding that, and there's a little tiny baby jump right there at the very end. And then we're snapping back down to the bottom. So uh, the constant key type is great for those situations where you need a blink-style animation. And it's something that we will be using a little bit later. So let's go ahead for now, and let's delete out this uh, central key. And we'll take our remaining keys, and we'll put those back over to auto tangents. Now, I'm going to actually put that key in the middle once again now that things are a little bit cleared up. So let's select our movement track and press Enter. And what I wanted to show you was that if I set this middle key over to break tangents, and we do some cool stuff with it, like maybe do some really wicked shape like that, this allows me to show the other two buttons. We can flatten the tangents to the axis, which we can do with really anything. Which will give us a nice ease in and an ease out of that particular keyframe. Or we can straighten them back out. So if you uh, have made them uh, broken, you can straighten them back out, and there you go. So uh, that's just a quick look at those two buttons. Now over from here, we have the Create Curve Tab System, and this allows you to create uh, various tabs full of curves that you're going to be using a lot. So you can keep them organized. Right. Now, the best way to show this off, first off, let me get rid of this extra uh, keyframe here. We don't really need it anymore, and I want my lift to go back to some semblance <laughs> of normality. What I'm going to do is remove this curve from our curve editor. Uh, in most cases, you're going to be spending a lot of time moving curves in and out of this editor. Right. You won't just leave them hanging here. It's not like you're deleting it. That's right. You're just getting it out of the editor. Think of this like an, analyze, uh, an analyzing machine. When you're done analyzing, get the curve out. So let's right-click and choose Remove Curve. And there we go. It's gone. Now, what I'm going to do is create a new tab. So Create Curve Tab. We'll call this the uh, Lift Curves or lift curve, singular. We could do uh, plural or singular, whichever. And now that we're in the lift curve tab, I can re-add this to the curve editor. So there's all of our curves. And now I have default, which is still empty. And then I have my lift curves in here. So it's a great way to use this as an organization system. So I can go refit those, and we can see all of our curves. So I could go through and add my lift curves. I could have another group for maybe door curves, and just go, d go down through that list and change them all around. Yeah, it's very handy for organization once again. If at some point you decide you don't need those, uh, those tabs anymore, you can go ahead and just click on the delete curve tab button and that'll nuke that out, but it won't allow you to, def uh, to delete the default tab. So there's a quick look at that. One more thing I will show is that if you have an animation curve that you've worked on for uh, you know several hours and it's exactly the way you like it, you can save that preset curve or you can uh, bring it back in. So just a quick mention of that to make sure that you're aware you can do that. And that is an overview of the entire curve editor. So let's go ahead and close that and get it back out of the way. And really, I think with that, we have covered a very thorough intro to the matinee editor and all the things it can do. But again, keep in mind that all we've really taken a look at is a very simple lift sequence. I mean, if I right-click on this group, you'll notice there are a lot of different tracks we can create. And each one of these tracks has a different specific behavior. Each one of these tracks is there for a very specific purpose. We have sound tracks, which is there for bringing in sound effects and playing them at certain times. Face effects tracks for playing facial animation. Event tracks, which is something we'll look at a little bit later, allowing us to trigger out new Kismet events. We have I mean, all sorts of different tracks 
each one playing a separate role. And again, we're not trying to show you each and every one in this video. We're more just trying to introduce you to matinee, but I do want you to be aware that those are there. And that is going to wrap things up for this video.